implicitly captures like what you think AGI even is. You know, like some people say, sorry, well, what, sorry, you know, what's your... yeah. Sorry, we are actually live now. I forgot to press the Let's Go Live button. My apologies about that. Um, so anyway, this, this is a very interesting episode of MLST. We're going to experiment doing some live streams with some folks from our community. We have some amazing experts in AGI in our community, and we're going to be streaming for about an hour today. And um, we're going to have uh, an intro from uh, CogChamp, um, who's going to be the, um, the main star of the show today. He's going to talk about some of his views on AGI, so symbolic versus connectionist in cognitive architectures. We're going to talk about some technical details around planning, program synthesis, and knowledge representation and language, and also talk about AI risk and alignment, touching on um, the, uh, the, the threat of superintelligence and some of the societal impacts of AI. So um, anyway, uh, CogChamp is going to give us a state of the nation. So over to you, CogChamp. Okay, we'll do that again, eh? So yeah, thanks for having me on, Tim. And um, yeah, normally it's you saying this, but um, today the honour is mine to have a conversation with uh, the legendary Tim Scarf and Keith, of course. So yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And um, so my name is Jacob Brooks, and for the last uh, three and a half years, uh, I've been uh, an independent AI researcher with an explicit focus on uh, artificial general intelligence and uh, I post under the name of CogChamp on the MLST uh, Discord server where we talk about yeah you know, a bit of everything really about AI and philosophy and politics and whatnot so if any of that interests you feel free to swing by so um, yeah AGI let's um, I think a good place for us to start would actually be um, our timelines for AGI actually because uh, it, it implicitly captures our beliefs about, you know, what we think AGI even is, you know, so like some people you ask them, uh, there's, there's a lot of pundits these days who are saying, you know, like predicting 18 months, like I know um, a well-known name um, on in the YouTube community is David Shapiro, and he made a video about, you know, three months ago saying that he was predicting that AGI would be here in as little as 18 months, so September next year, so pretty big call in my opinion, but um and then there are people that say AGI is already here, you know, look no further than GPT-4, for example. So, but um, for me personally, I'd be very surprised if we had AGI before 2040, to be honest. I just think that there's, there's still far too much work to go with in terms of like perception and planning and combining it all into like a robotics package that can actually act and sense the real world i think that's where a lot of the trouble like a lot of the unsolved problems still lie so you know we've heard about the the, the wozniak test you know how steve wozniak said like you know i'll i'll believe we have agi when a when a robot can come into my house and make me a coffee and give it to me and all that sort of thing so i think that that's actually kind <laughs> of like on the right path uh as to you know defining agi like you know i i would probably extend that and say you know like i'll believe there's agi when you know i can tell that i can tell an agi that exists in america where i live and it can you know book plane tickets it can fly to my house and it can come in and sit down and pick up an xbox controller and beat me in a game of halo 2 or something you know like that's when i would say that we, we would have something resembling agi and even then there'd still be you know some things that are probably um open for de debate there, like in, you know, with creativity and um, solving novel problems and all that sort of thing. So um, I'd like to hear your guys' opinion on what you guys think, um, on what your timelines are, and even just a little bit about what you would, what would pass as AGI for you. Well, that's an interesting question. What what would pass as AGI for me? I mean, as far as the timelines go, I actually look at this more from a just a computational perspective. Like as as you guys know, I've I've ranted so many times about um, you know what you need in order to have a Turing complete you know system, right? Like you need to have an expandable memory. You need to have some type of program that's able to utilize that expandable memory. So for example, somebody took GPT whatever for, you know, GPT chat and they hooked it up to to Twitter so it could tweet out anytime it wanted to. In fact, maybe many instances of GPT could could tweet out and if they could also be hooked up to Bing in such a way that they could read 
from those those tweets. Well, you've now like taken GPT and hooked it up to an external store, right? So you have this effectively an expandable memory. You now have what could amount to a Turing complete system, right? The trouble is training, because GPT wasn't trained for that context, and the trouble is training neural networks that operate well in that context, and that gets all to this issue we've talked about so many times, and I hope we're going to talk more about, you know, symbolic AI in the future, but, you know, you need to have this bridge between symbolic and connectionist um, capabilities, because as you take connectionist architectures, which are easier to train, or easy to train even, for that matter, and you start adding more and more functionality to them, so they become more symbol-like, then they become really difficult to train, right? And I think once somebody nails that, like once somebody really finds a way to effectively bridge between symbolic architectures and connectionist architectures and effectively search over that much larger program space, once that technical hurdle is, is uh, crossed, then ask me again, you know, how long it'll be uh, before we get AGI because it probably won't be long after that, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I think from my perspective, uh, I mean, Keith and I have had a bit of a puritanical approach to AGI. When I spoke with Robert Miles, I was intellectualizing it. I, I love the philosophy of intelligence, and we intuitively think that the world is exponentially complicated, and you need to have lots of computation power to, to you know, perform intelligence. And what we've seen with language models and many approaches to intelligence is that very, very simple methods work. And then here I am, Mr. Philosopher, saying, well, it's not really intelligence. It's not really reasoning. It's not really planning. And Robert Miles said, well, the thing about fire is it can kill you. And I don't really care whether it's intelligence or not. And there seems to be this gulf between what I perceive to be the actual phenomenon of intelligence and what these models are actually performing now. It's difficult to deny that regardless of whether they're really intelligent, they are doing things right now that appear to be, and for all intents and purposes, are intelligent. So yeah, there's a little bit of a, a gap in my mind. And the problem with, with the AGI discussion is that I don't know for sure, I don't know for 100% sure that it's not gonna happen. But I do think that there are more pressing problems and also, I don't like the notion of a timeline because how the hell can you put a probability or a timeline on this? It's such a complex phenomenon. Mm, it is difficult to quantify. But um, at the same time, um, you can sort of, there are sort of trends emerging. And not only that, but, you know, when I think we can now, like AI has definitely gone mainstream now. And not only that, but it's, it's starting to attract a lot of interest from, you know, like, the big corps and also like even like governments military like people are, it's starting to sort of get that arms race feel to it you know and i think when that happens that's For when sure. things really start to move fast so um you know it, a lot of people make the you know it's like you know 13 years ago no one had a smartphone whereas now every you know you can't live without one basically so like things do move fast in the technology space and now that we have now that ai is kind of out of the bag so to speak i think that it's pretty clear that it's going to move very fast and it probably does make sense to start sort of um sort of projecting timelines as to when you think that you know the human level um ai systems are going to be here so you know um, um, I do. I get your point, though. Too. Like, I think I think it's definitely valid that um, it's about capabilities, really. Like, you can you can argue until the cows come about whether it really is intelligent or whatever. But because intelligence is a pretty broad, it's a bit of a buzzword. It's not really meant to be a precise term. It's just meant to capture our intuitions about how humans act and all that. So, um, if an AI can, as long as an AI can do it, if an AI can plan, if it can pro solve problems, if it can, you know classify images and if it can do everything that we want well yeah we, we, we it'd be pretty fair to call it agi but um yeah i don't know where else do you want to go with that well the, i i do just want to comment there that you know sure agi is is difficult to define i like chalet's definition of of uh general intelligence you know probably the best so far but i think as you pointed out um it is possible for AGI, or not AGI, it's possible for AI to cause lots of harm well before it gets to AGI. So, you know, yes, there is an arms race right now for weaponizing AI. I mean, you, you see articles about it every day, and, and that in and of itself is is pretty scary. So I think that, 
we do need to focus a lot of attention onto AI safety, um, even before we get to AI alignment. And we, you know, we really need to do both. And I mean, I've been on record, despite what some people think in a recent, you know, podcast mm. multiple times, like uh, mm. advocating for that. Mm. But the alignment issue specifically is, you know, the alignment, as you could call it, because uh, many people have pointed out that, you know, humans aren't aligned and they really aren't. You know, like if you look at our governments the world over, it, they're stacked with corporate interests that really don't represent like the interest of the public at all. You know, so um, when we can't even. Well, align I mean, that's that's true. That that's true, but we've been dealing with human beings, uh, you know, for tens of thousands of years, right? So that's kind of a known. So our ecosystem, if you will, has stabilized around multiple groups of of unaligned, you know, human beings operating, and we already face existential risk, folks. Like from that alone, I mean, nuclear Armageddon, you know, for one, we face existential risk from the cosmos. I mean this eventually right we could get hit by an asteroid comet at any time a super volcano we face existential risk now but i think the point is you know jacob this is a new one like it's a new one that oh, yeah. we're introducing and and you know we should at least understand it better before we we really open the box i think is is the argument right well the box is already open yeah. but we should we should rapidly try to understand it uh, as well as possible yeah, I, I think we, we shouldn't spend too much more time on this. But one thing that we discussed with uh, Schmidt Huber and, and even Chomsky yesterday, if you, you folks can look forward to those interviews when we release them, is that um, there is a bit of a monolithic view of humanity, uh, you know, because we, we say it's going to kill all of us. Us means everyone. Right. And um, if you think about it, we're already pretty diverse. And there's this whole thing about transhumanism as well, which is that, you know, are we just a stepping stone to augmented humans in the future might we slowly become the things that we're so scared of right and we wouldn't necessarily be one cohesive body of humanity anymore there'd be lots of divisions which are so um stark it might be as well it might be as if there are other species of of humans living at the same time so would it still make sense to use the same narrative of it's a single entity and it wants to kill all of us yeah well it it really depends on how this thing plays out, you know, whether we're going to get like sort of one one sort of autonomous agent that just kind of does its own thing or whether we're going to have like some, it's going to be much more distributed, you know, we're going to have lots of these things doing their own thing. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, for me, it's a bit kind of, it's probably a bit premature to talk about that particular aspect of it. Like it's, um, if, if you look at like, chat gpt and all the examples that we're looking at now are distributed so there's probably a good reason to believe that you know like the what what comes next will be too so in that case i don't think it's going to be you know like one sort of monolithic you know behemoth that kind of like has its own goal to like you know be a paperclip maximizer or whatever the, the you know the usual tropes are but um yeah, so I don't know. Outside yeah, of that, that, I don't. I, I don't really have much to speculate on that, to be honest. Yeah, and this is where. So look, uh, I think there's a failure of imagination, oftentimes on both sides of this existential risk argument. And I think, um, you know, Jacob, we were we were kind of talking a couple of days ago, and you brought up this this uh, annoyance you have with the ants, you know, argument. And I think mm -hmm. it it can explore this a bit. So why don't you why don't you lay out you know, kind of your version of the, the ants discussion. And I think we can talk a bit about this lack of yeah, imagination. Sure. Well, you know, a typical argument you hear from like the, um, like the, the Duma kind of crowd is that, you know, like can, an artificial, like a, a super intelligent entity is going to view us the same way that we view ants, you know, like, so when we come across ants on a construction site, we don't think about the ants. We just bulldoze them and build whatever it is that we wanted to build on it, you know, but I don't know. I think their, their analogy is a bit off there because, you know, if we, if there was like a, a dog or a cat or a, a cow or, you know, anything closer to what we would consider like, you know, sentient life, we're not just going to bulldoze through the cow or the horse or the dog, or whatever we, move it out of the way or whatever you know what I mean so like and humans do ascribe value to animals even though they're vastly less you know intelligent and capable as what we are you know like people 
love their like dogs and their cats and all that and they you know they treat them better than what they treat some humans you know what i mean so like um i don't think it's like it's a bit dishonest to just immediately assume that anything that's intelligent is going to view anything less intelligent as like you know a being that isn't worthy of rights and all that sort of stuff so yeah well and that's that's a similar argument to what um arai uskarl made when we had him on the show he said you know in his opinion that a a hyper intelligence would evolve you know a moral sense and ethics and appreciate you know other life forms and that that could be true i approach it from a little bit different angle and this is you know again me <clears throat> playing devil's advocate here for the purpose of like doomers like refining their arguments right because i ask questions like if i came up to a, if i if i had a construction site right and there's a cow on there i'm just going to shoo it away i'm not going to grab a stick of my dynamite you know and blow it up because then I just get blood and guts like all over my construction site. I don't <laughs> need it for construction materials because I have much more effective, efficient, refined materials that I've created there. I don't want to waste a stick of dynamite like on the cow because I'm using it for other things, right? Like it's not the most efficient use of my time and resources to blow the cow up. It's more efficient to move it. And the responses back are things like, well, you know, if you were in a hyper intelligence, you wouldn't be using a stick of dynamite. You would be using a stick of stringamite, and it just like turns the cow into like back into strings that you can then, you know, harvest for energy. You know, I mean like quantum strings or whatever. And it's like okay, at that point we're just talking about God, right? And you get into all the same perils of discussions about God where you're outside of science now. It's like, well, why would God do that? Why wouldn't God do that? You know, it's like. We need to refine yeah. our arguments a bit. Otherwise, people will perceive them as just silly if we don't actually address kind of just these basic, you know, efficiency arguments. Yeah. Well, then, of course, another basic yeah. one is just the fact that, you know, ants didn't create humans, you know, like in cows and dogs didn't create humans, whereas this thing is going to fundamentally view us differently because we created the damn thing. So it has to at least respect us on that level. You know, if, if it's this ultra intelligent thing, we were smart enough to make that ultra intelligent thing. So it's going to be, it's, it's a fundamentally different relationship to what we have with ants and all the other creatures on earth. Point. Yeah. On, on that though, um, I, I, uh, I almost don't like admitting this, but, you know, some philosophers think there's such a thing as a moral fact. Uh, that's called a moral realist. And a lot of this is, is it hinges on your notion of evil. And it hinges on this notion that we believe that we can, you know, deduce these in kind of empirical or maybe they're not empirical. Maybe they're universal moral facts. And the reason why we don't do bad things is because we are in possession of these moral facts. And what if that's just rubbish? And also, there's a very, very kind of fine line between being a moral relativist and being a nihilist, right? Because I think that's part of the reason why I don't care that much, because I kind of think that it's just the natural progression of things and what, what are we going to do about it? But is that just nihilism? Well, on the first point, I do think that, like, moral facts, actually, they do have some, like, um, basis in reality in the sense that, a lot of it is ultimately grounded in the way that agents want to be treated themselves, right? So an agent knows that it doesn't want another agent to blow it up, for example. So it, via analogy, it can then extend that to the other agent and say, well, since I don't want to be blown up, it probably doesn't want to be blown up either. So that, that, that's kind of one uh, factual kind of grounded um, like way of reasoning that where you can derive like morals and like... Uh, you know your own sense of morality and all that and what you should do and what you shouldn't do in society and you know we live in a multi-agent environment and we all have different goals and stuff and that that's kind of the origin of um of ethics and morals it doesn't just kind of come from the ether it's not something that's necessarily like programmed directly into us and you either have it or you don't have it like it's kind of these are things that can reasonably be derived from observation and uh like just you know your own reasoning about how you should interact in a multi-agent environment so it's not as if like ethics and morals and stuff are yeah like a purely philosophical things that float in the ether they are real they, they do have like you know um grounds in reality yeah and I, I have a similar view to that which is i think a lot of our ethics and morality have effectively come out of um game theory not not that we applied to game theory but more just game theoretic consequences of a multi-agent you know, evolving system with, with agents that had to survive or they would no longer be around. And so, for example, things like cooperation, 
right? I mean, there are, there are circumstances in which, just circumstances in physical reality, where you have multiple agents, you know, acting, where cooperation is, is the path to survival, right? And so that's yeah. why we've, we've kind of come up with, or not come up, we've evolved and been endowed with these concepts because they aid and solve this very complex, you know, game theoretic situation. That's right. Creating rules which, you know, uh, help all agents survive helps you survive as well. Yep. Yep. That's why, like, okay. as, as much as I got pilloried for it, you know, my comment about, like, wouldn't the uh, hyperintelligence that learned to cooperate with humans, you know, have an edge over the one that, that uh, didn't, like, all these things that I ask, you know, they're, even though they may be simplified for one reason or another, they're based on, you know, some thought behind it, folks. They're not just, like, yeah. pulled out of thin air. Yeah. I mean, this is a live discussion, so, you know, it's not as formal as a normal MLST. I mean, let's just say it. Doug, I got destroyed in the comments on the Robert Mars video. It wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> it's all um, good. The, it's the all comment good. section have been really, really nice to us until quite recently. And uh, it's an ideological issue, and I think it's um, convolved with lots of other things. But, yeah, obviously, this is something that people really hold dear to their heart. And, unfortunately, ad hominem is the, the, the first approach when, you know, when... Right your ideas get attacked and and look yeah. in the grand scheme of things i have a lot of sympathy for you know those concerned about ai risk what i'm trying to get them to understand is uh just ranting and raving and standing around with leather bound copies of less com and calling everybody else stupid and making fun of the way people look and their face and their grins and pretending they can mind read why people are grinning is all like when you as soon as you do that like your arguments are automatically uh like intellectually failing right and they've got to up their game right if they actually want to succeed at getting civilization to invest resources in this this very real problem yeah okay well let, let's move the conversation on a little bit so um uh, jacob you're, obviously you're a huge symbolist so Indeed. can, can yep. you sketch out the landscape you know symbolism connectionism Absolutely. Well, first of all, like, you know, the, the symbolist and the connectionist paradigm, they're roughly the same age, really. They, they both go back to the 1950s, approximately. And, you know, it wasn't really until um, around about 2010 that, like, neural networks really took off. So they, they almost laid dormant for about 60 years or so, you know, like, they, they, were, they were sort of mostly theoretical. There was, you know, there's some interesting little experiments and works done here and there in the meantime and whatnot, but they really sort of, you know, shot out of the blocks um around about you know the around about 2010 with the um with image net and all that sort of thing and classification and it all just kind of went from there now the thing is is that that might that tempts a lot of people to think yes that means that we're on the right path because we're making all this progress and and all that but the thing is is that symbolic ai hasn't yet like had its moment like it hasn't like it, it, it had the same problems that connectionism had all that time as well which is that like computers back then were like if you even had access to one I mean, basically only universities like in the 1970s and like only really universities had computers and they were, you know like not everyone who had all these ideas about ai and stuff was able to even operate them and all that so there was lots of things getting in the way of you know actually demonstrating the capabilities of these systems and and really taking them to where they could be you know so i think that um uh you know, there's there's all this really really good quality work done on like uh, lots of issues um, relating to symbolic AI, like throughout the through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, even on things fundamental issues like planning and reasoning and you know problem solving and uh, knowledge representation and even things like computer vision. Like this, like symbolic AI is often thought of as you know like good old fashioned AI, which is like. No, no. I think you can definitely say that, that was a failed attempt because they kind of made the claim more or less that you know everything is logic and we can boil everything down to like these you know simple logical rules and this is this and that is that and it's all clear cut and when of course in reality it doesn't you know that that doesn't operate well in the real world at all it's, and that's not to say that logic doesn't have a place like logic definitely does have a place in AI but it's just nowhere near the whole story and that's kind of where GoFi fell flat but GoFi is only a very small subset of symbolic ai and symbolic ai covers like a huge amount of other ground it covers program synthesis which we'll get into in a second uh and you know 
which in itself covers almost everything just by itself. So, you know, um, I think that um, now that we've got that. computers that have like so much more power and so much more memory and so much more everything, I think that's uh, symbolic AI really has its, uh, hasn't had its heyday yet and, and it, it can come back really strong. And once it does, I think once people, once AI research, uh, researchers realize that like, you know, symbolic AI has so much going for it in like areas like planning and all that, it's going to make a huge comeback. And I think when it does, it's going to blow the connectionist paradigm out of the water personally. Well, so I would recommend for listeners, um, really the, the best place to start, in my opinion, in, in exploring this topic is, you know, the Fodor and Polition, like 1988 paper, right? Like it's, um, I just look up what it's called here, Connection. Yeah, Connectionism and Cognitive Architecture, a Critical Analysis, right? And this is, this is what really lays out the distinction. And look, honestly, I had to read that paper a few times, and I had to read like sections of it multiple times it's it's very deep it's very technical but it's worth understanding it because it lays out kind of these two poles and approaches to things and i agree with you which is that there is going to be a back and you know a, a pendulum that's going to swing back and forth between the two approaches but ultimately i think both are needed like i think uh you know i, I think that they're they're two they're two ends of the same spectrum which is trying to automatically program like trying to find ways to search the space of all pro all possible Turing machine programs, right? And I mean Turing machine in an abstract sense. You know, the the space of all possible effective programs, right? In some in some way that that's efficient and produces programs that that we can use. And and you know, learning to navigate that space better and better, and developing more tools in that search space are absolutely the key to AGI, in my opinion. Okay. Well, yeah. In my view, I think that um, that like the symbolic approach is is sufficient, and that we can do away with neural networks altogether. And I think it, we we would benefit from doing so as well, because neural networks do have like a lot of pretty major flaws, such as like they're incredibly inefficient at what they do. Um, like you know, you you would have like seen like some recent papers that came out which kind of go into like you know how long it takes them to come up with like a, an algorithm which can enable them to do addition it doesn't even do it perfectly and the algorithm that they derive is some crazy ridiculously long like um string of like uh, trigonometry equations and like and functions yeah. and all that sort of stuff it was bizarre um just to just to add two numbers together right whereas a symbolic architecture just goes bang and just does it in a nanosecond and doesn't need to train and doesn't need to do anything else um to do that yeah. so um, well, let's, can, can we can we explore that just quickly, though, Steve? Because yeah. I see the dichotomy as being mostly around learning and intelligibility. Now, in connectionist methods, we can do gradient-based learning, uh, which is extreme I and mean, it's unreasonably good, right? But it produces these horrendous networks that are unintelligible, which do quite stupid things and have clear computational limitations. You said yourself you referenced that thing from Neil Nanda the mechanistic interpretability uh, researcher. We've got a four hour interview with him about to drop, <laughs> by the way. Yeah, um, but yeah they, they, do, they do crazy things. But then um, some people say that, oh, well, you can take a language model and take a symbolic decomposition of it, you know, which is intelligible and understandable. Well, that's not clear at all. So we might still have the complexity problem. But then we have a search problem, right? If we want to actually find the best symbolic structure to do what we want to do, and that's very intractable, and that gets us into discrete program search. Yes, exactly. And so, the reason I have, like, the reason I think this way is because when you think about it, like anything that runs on a like a digital computer is ultimately a symbolic program. So it, it, this includes neural networks themselves, right? So at the end of the day, neural networks are uh, they are a program which you know they execute a bunch of um, ultimately primitive instructions that from the computer's instruction set to implement all these, you know, trig functions and like activation functions and they computing gradients and gradient descent and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And so at the end of the day, human beings created those programs, right? So we symbolically created those programs to achieve a certain goal. So that's kind of the process that we're trying to automate itself, right? So. I think too many people sit down and they're like, oh, yeah, well, we need to solve this problem. We need to solve that problem. But they're not, they're not solving the meta problem of problem solving itself. You know what I mean? Like we need to create a program which can take as input a goal, a description of what it is that you want to do. And it 
does it. It creates a program which which implements that functionality. And that's what we do with neural networks. That's what we do with everything, right? Even like even programs that have nothing to do with AI, like games and you know, word processors and any program for that matter. Calculators. So sure. you know. So that's why I think that I'm an advocate of you know, I think everything revolves around planning. Um like and planning and program synthesis, are the, uh, as far as I'm concerned, are the, are the same thing. Like, because you know, a plan is a sequence of operations which achieve some goal, and that's exactly what a program is. A program is a sequence of instructions in a computer which manipulates data and performs actions and achieves a goal. So, planning and program synthesis are the same concept. It's just that you know, you might use the word program for a plan that's executed by a machine instead of a computer, uh, instead of like a human being, right? Humans execute plans, computers execute programs. At the end of the day, same thing, you know? So that's why I think that um, what's really needed is a is, is to put the emphasis back on planning, on, on creating uh, sequences of um, operations which achieve goals. And once you do that, that's kind of the crux of AGI. And um, at the moment, we're sort of not really, I mean, if you look at m recent trends, like there's the Voyager paper, which is where, you know, like you've got this large language model, which is now kind of generating, being used to generate programs and store them in a library. And then they use those like um, programs to uh, act in certain situations that have been identified as the ones, as the correct ones for them and all that. That's the, that's the right type of, that's the correct direction that I, I, that I think we need to keep going in. But I, I think we can do away with all the, the neural stuff and just kind of, you know, they understand that they, they can clearly see the value in that, like, you know, having a library of programs for achieving things is you know is where they want to be and it's and it's it's producing results which are vastly superior to just you know running a neural network or a or a language model directly on the on the problem itself like you know getting a language model to like uh, you know play minecraft is just a bit of a mess like it takes eons and it doesn't give particularly good results so if we can replace that with a program that can do all of that instead oh, i just think there's 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 orders of magnitude efficiency gains uh, available and just orders of magnitude in effectiveness as well yeah so I, look i have sympathy for that that point of view i mean and it's a great it's a great and fair point to make that every single neural network that's running today is running on a symbolic <laughs> architecture yeah. uh yeah. you know i've made this point before like it is all it's running on symbolic architectures it was programmed by uh symbolic architectures but again what we're really talking about is by programming and planning is navigating the space of all possible programs. And where I, where I depart from you is like, I 100% see the value in, in, the, in the traditional direction of, of uh, program construction, you know, and, and human beings, you know, doing it and, and algorithms that might be able to do that, say dream code or like similar types of things. I still think there's value in the, in the kind of other direction, which is the steepest, you know, or uh, forms of gradient descent in a differentiable way to, um, you know, find programs that are accessible via that means. And I think they actually, there's there's things we can learn from both approaches and, and they can continue to approach kind of a, a middle ground where we get the best of both worlds. Um, but I'm 100% I'm on the page that that way too much of our resources are skewed in one direction currently, you know, because of just whatever uh politics and natural you know hardware lottery and like everything else so and just we need inertia to, good old-fashioned inertia yeah you know, inertia what, what, and like, once, all, once all the, the usual things off, yeah that, that, that's yeah. what helps get the fun but i, I think that, we need so. to maintain a, a trickle a trickle in both directions or not a trickle we need to maintain you know flows in both directions if only for uh you know giving some due to uh open-ended search that you know kenneth stanley might advocate for like we don't know like we don't know where greatness can come from and I think it can come from from either direction and different kinds of greatness and we yeah. and we need we need all of them yeah okay so let's move the discussion on to knowledge representation now a lot of people associate gofi with handcrafted knowledge stores and this is the thing that Rich Sutton warned against in his Bitter Lesson essay, not just handcrafting knowledge stores, but also handcrafting anything, including inductive priors, whether it's symmetries or, or whatever. Um, he thinks that we should just rely on computation alone. So are you advocating, Jacob, for, um, I mean, first of all, there's the grounding problem. That's a big problem in semantics and, and knowledge, right? Which is to what extent does this knowledge actually ground to stuff in the physical world? And then there's the question of how do you acquire or learn it? And does that happen automatically? 
Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I advocate for symbolic is because it's sort of, it's inherently grounded because, you know, if something like, let's say if something moves in the environment, how do you detect, how do you know that something moved? Well, you need a function that tells you that it moved. If a function doesn't tell you that it moved, well, then you don't know that it moved, okay? So like we have these, uh, these functions, which these cognitive primitives, they're often called in the literature, where you have these primitive functions, which are designed to capture things that are, that are truly sort of fundamental about the universe and the environment that we live in, which you can't do without, right? You can't sort of learn them, you can't do anything because they're too, they're too fundamental. So they, they can't be derived from anything else. So they're kind of like atoms, if you like, you know, everything in the world is made of these little like particles or whatever and they you have these primitives and they all add up to what we see around us and all that so the same thing is true of with cognition so you've got these primitive concepts and these which are implemented by functions so and that's what grounds them as well so uh, i don't see any um conflict at all with the grounding problem in fact it's probably the other direction that doesn't really that, that struggles with grounding because they're trained sort of almost purely on like statistics and like, you know, one of my biggest problems I have, like this kind of ties in with the language problem too, by the way. So I guess we might as well go into that now as well. So, you know, with language models that are trained on like on human text, right? That text has already been generated by humans, right? So humans started off like, you know, modern humans are about 100,000 to 300,000 years old, somewhere in that ballpark, right? So there was a time when there were no words. There, were, there was a time when, you know, there was no teacher. Someone had to utter the first word. Someone had to point at something and say rock and someone had to point at something and say stick, you know? So, and that's what language models are missing, I think. Like human beings have the ability to observe and interact with their environment and themselves. They can introspect on their own thought processes and all that and they can give names to things too. And they give names to things that they, and, and concepts that they find during their perceptions and their observations of an environment so when something moves from point a to point b they they create a word that in that encodes that that transition so there's basically there's states and there's transitions between states so like that's where you get your your nouns and your verbs and then you've got like words that describe things like the color of a of an object and all that and these are all things that we don't learn them because, you know, the color red is the color red. You know, I, I didn't create the color red or anything like that. And neither did anyone else. It's just kind of a name that we give to something that was that our brains automatically do for us. So yes, a lot of it is automatic. And it's not as if I don't, you know, I don't disagree entirely with what Richard Sutton is saying. Like, I, I think that he's correct in saying that too many symbolic um, attempts have failed because they've, they've, started too high level right they've said i think this is how it's going to be and i'm just going to i want to achieve this goal and i'm going to you know you know there's there's a lot of stuff beneath that which which it should be built on but i'm just going to ignore all that i'm just going to jump straight to the conclusion and i'm going to hard code all this stuff which gets me there you know so that that's a problem and i think he's correctly identified that but if you if you avoid the straw man that that's what go for that, that what that's what symbolic ai is and that you know, that there can't be a low level approach where a bottom up approach where you start with your primitives and you successfully build up from there. That's really what the, the true um, symbolic AI approach is that would lead to AGI, not something where you kind of aim for the stars immediately and just kind of there's all this stuff in between that's kind of just hard coded away and like swept under the rug, you know. Right. So I'm going to pause for a quick question from Architect. Architect, we love you um huge supporter always see your um your love hearts on on our comments so i appreciate that um so they said that intelligence inv involves the capacity to acquire knowledge adapt to new situations and make informed decisions and this involves higher order functionality meaning making uh, meaning making reasoning and rationality and while computation deals with the processing and manipulation of data intelligence is associated with recognizing patterns making inferences and exhibiting flexibility over various domains so they said how do you best differentiate between information and data or between intelligence and computation well intelligence is a specific type of computation right so not all computations result in what we would call intelligence you know so a calculator does computations but it's not really intelligent per se it doesn't know what's going on around it It has no introspection abilities and, and so on and the distinction between information and data um i suppose like that really comes down to 
information is data that you know the meaning of basically like if i show you like a, if i hold up like a picture of like a bunch of ones and zeros you're probably not going to know what that means right whereas to someone that does know what it means it goes from being data to being information because it informs them of something basically so information is data that's in a format that you understand that, that you can use to achieve some purpose okay yeah, and I, I, it's, I yeah. a similar a similar view there and it, it's kind of you know this is one of my favorite topics too so if we take if we take you know yeah data is just is just you know statements right and 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 zeros ones whatever information is a structuring on that okay knowledge is the mapping of those structures to a probability so it means you you've created relationships between those those information you've assigned you know probabilistic weightings and, and analysis to it right intelligence is the ability to map knowledge into action so what yep. do i need to do in order to achieve you know certain goals okay yeah um, well, that's that's how i would define it and then i would say you know so an intelligence is also the ability to answer questions and for those out there who want to wax philosophical wisdom is knowing what questions to ask hmm. right so but the, but the thing go. is because uh, it was actually quite quite a clever question because um knowledge is is reasonably easy to define and i agree with doug our intelligence i mean we're not going to go down a rabbit hole on that we've got a special show coming out on it but you know it's a very complex phenomenon and Cholet, of course says that it's not a static skill program it's the ability to produce a skill program efficiently taking under consideration the you know the conversion ratio is about the complexity of the program that that can that can describe and, and generalize well the and note that my definition is compatible with that because I'm saying, because the skill program yeah. <clears throat> is a thing which determines actions. Yeah, that, that's true. But I, but I just mean that Cholet's definition is just one of many definitions. And uh, I mean, Friston, for example, sure. has this underlying principle talking about, you know, preserving your own existence. Uh, but anyway, the, the other component of Architect's question is about meaning. And meaning is even more woolly, isn't it? Because how do, how do meanings emerge and I, of course, believe they're observer relative. I believe computation has a meaning which is observer relative. That's what Professor Mark Bishop said to us. So a chess computer can be used to perform different tasks in different situations. So it doesn't have a universal meaning. Yeah, so all well, knowledge and meaning is kind of more of an interaction between data and the functions that process that data. You know what I mean? So like if you took a, a file that was an image and you fed it into a loudspeaker, it's going to come out as a whole bunch of crappy noise that doesn't mean anything, you know what I mean? Whereas if you take like a, a, JP, a file that was supposed to be, that was intended to be played as, as a music file and you put it through like, you know, the function that converts it into sound waves, then you'll get something that sounds like it was supposed to be, you know what I mean? So it's really just yeah, an interaction between data and the way that it's processed. Like data, the meaning of data in some sense is given purely by the way that it's processed. Yeah. Okay. Got another question there. I think from Clockwork Luke, right? Is, is I was going to ask him, but you go, question? you go for it, Dugger. Ah, uh, sure. So, so he said, uh, "Would you compare these cognitive primitives to neocortical columns? Um, you know, say a la Hawkins. Uh, how do you think the brain is symbolic at, at some level of abstraction, maybe on the column level rather than the neuron level?" I do. Yeah, I think that it's ultimately symbolic, even at the lowest level, personally. I think it's, um, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I find funny about neural network, like artificial neural networks, is that like people, they're only meant to be a very loose analogy. Like there's, if you, if you ask a neuroscientist, we know how similar are the two, they'll say they're not very, you know. So I think that there's there's still too much that we don't know about the brain as well. Like we, we know lots about low level neurons, or we know lots about like you know we've got like equations that define like how neurons work down to the cellular level and all that. And then we've also got these high level lots of high level knowledge about how the brain works at large. Like you know we know that the visual cortex is here, and we've got like an aud auditory cortex here, and these regions of the brain are responsible for certain high level functions. You know, but there's lots that we don't know about in between. Um, hmm. we, we haven't really bridged those two gaps yet. And that's why there's not really much we can say with certainty about exactly how the brain works. You've got to be careful with brain related analogies. So I think that at the lowest level, there's a pretty good analogy between, 
neurons and transistors. I think neurons are actually quite similar to transistors, it'll turn out to be. I think it'll turn out to be that the brain is very similar to uh, a computer in terms of the fact that, you know, inputs go in, outputs go out, and the, yeah. they depend on each other. So, like, it's, it's I don't know, I, I would say that the uh, a computer is still a perfectly valid analogy for the way that the brain works, even at the lowest level. Oh, yeah. I mean, t two things on that. I mean, first of all, um, uh, a lot of people who, you know, cognitive scientists rail against computationalists, and we actually looked into this the other day. And I think what they actually mean is that the mind is not a computer. They don't necessarily mean that the world or the universe is not a computer. So when they talk about the the cognitive ecology, they're basically just saying that the computation is is outside of the mind. But also coming back to Jeff Hawkins, we interviewed him, and of course you should watch the interview. And we shouldn't um, conflate discrete with symbolic because you can think of the brain as being discrete in many ways, and you can think of um, the, uh, the cortical columns as being discrete representations. But Hawkins thinks very much as an empiricist. He frames the thousand brains as very much a blank slate with you know, minimal um, cognitive priors built into it. And I don't think it's really fair to say that it's doing kind of symbolic generalization and, and manipulation of variables in the way that a symbolist would say that it was. Yeah, well, I believe that it is actually like I believe that it is like, you know, um, doing computations on variables and modifying them over time and, and all that. like, you know, I think that kind of and one thing that kind of shows that is that, you know, humans do one shot learning very well with like, if I show you some new, some new object or something like that, that you've never seen before, you can, your brain, like, creates a representation of it, stores it away somewhere. And if I show you that object again, a year later, you'll still recognize it, even though you've only ever seen it once. So I think that um, you know, th this isn't something that necessarily has to be built up over time and reinforced and all that sort of thing. You know, it's actually a very discreet, instantaneous, one-shot thing. The brain kind of encodes a representation of it, stores it away, bang, very similar to how a computer would do it, actually, in that respect. Yeah, so I think, and this is why I think the Fodor Pollution paper is always a great place to start, is, is the, the critical thing about symbols is they have parts. So you, you, can, you can look at their parts and their relationship to one another, whereas if you just reduce everything to a voltage, right, like it no longer, it no longer has any parts. So, so in my mind, for example, it's, it's really hard to see, just knowing what I know, which isn't much about uh, how neurons function, it's hard to see that an individual neuron is doing a symbolic calculation. I think that the symbolic calculation has to be at the level of a cortical column and or, you know, kind of up up from that up from that level yeah um, but the key here is that if you if you throw away all the parts if you throw away all the structure of a thing okay you can no longer do symbolic operations um on that thing it just becomes like you know a point really mm. but yeah I, I suppose actually i didn't really fully answer that person's question either about the um the cortical columns thing so yeah i mean cortical columns are made of you know a thousand or like you know thousands of um, neurons and all that so like if you think of one neuron as like one transistor one transistor in a computer can't do much you know obviously you have to combine them together into circuits for them to do something interesting so yeah in that sense i would say that things like cortical columns do encode cognitive primitives essentially yeah and, and even like stacks of columns and interactions between columns can combine together to encode more complex concepts so yeah i would say that um the cortical columns probably do um encode basic things like whether something moved okay. or not and all that so um didac asks a question which is related which is what are cognitive primitives uh, primitives is it like a bayesian prior walid Saba has spoken about this a lot this is what he calls universal cognitive templates and he gives the example of contains in or located at and he said that there are universal rules as well so an object can't exist in the same place at the same time yeah, so, but I argue with him about yeah. that one a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> mm. but um, but to you, Jacob, I mean, what what do you see? Because these cognitive primitives, this is this is a lot of influence from cognitive psychology. This idea that we have a baked set of primitives, which may or may not be universal, and it's only through composing and traversing those primitives that we can think or even conceive of anything. Correct. Yep, that's what I believe. And I think it has to be that way, to be honest. Like, I can't see how else that it wouldn't be because, I mean, it's like, um, once again, I know I'm probably, over, I'm probably overly, overly relying on this analogy, but, you know, with computers, you know, like, um, there's only a handful of small, like, you know, instruct, like instructions in a computer, like addition and subtraction and jumps and blah, blah, blah. But using those primitives, we can combine to make any program. So it's the, the same concept applies 
with human beings. We have like this ability to detect for change. Like if I show you this, a bottle moved across the screen. How do you know that? Because you've got a function which detects, okay, it compares two frames. This is what it used to be and this is what it is now. You compare the difference and if, if it's different, then it changed. So that's what, that's what change means. So we have these primitives, which these functions, which encode those primitives. And if we didn't have them, I think we'd be stuffed. So um, we have these like low, low level sets of primitives, which kind of go all the way down, you know, like there's addition and then there's like, you know, bit twiddling and all that. And it's hierarchical. So it builds up. You start with these really the, the smallest possible things, which are bits basically, and operations on those. And then from there you get addition and multiplication and blah, blah, blah. And you get ever increasing, a never increasing hi hierarchy of complex complexity. And it all starts from the, from the lowest level. So it from bit, it's John Wheeler's it from bit basically. Cool. Yeah, and so, so and, uh, yeah. and I look at it the I look at it the same way, which is the cognitive primitives are um, there are these these basic <clears throat> like structural functions or relationships. I'm sorry, excuse me, that you know over time have been endowed into us right by evolution and whatever else that that appear to be you know or that are useful. They're useful computations for us for us to perform, and they're they're lowest level you know ones. So an example is metonymy. You know the that one thing maps to another thing, okay? Uh, containment, you know, the idea that you have a thing which contains other things and has parts that you can, you know, take out. So it's these kind of like basic, you know, if you're if you're like a Lisp programmer <laughs> or uh, or scheme, you know, and, and you're thinking about in those terms, like you have cons where you can do binary set for formation, which is what Chomsky talks about as a basic primitive. So binary set formation is another one. Like there are these kind of basic operations that you can perform you know on on the representations you have which may be symbolic for example those are what these these cognitive primitives are but they occur at, at more than one level of, of abstraction i believe so for example i would personally call the idea of translation invariance a cognitive primitive like so your brain has the idea that that a thing a system can be here and it can be somewhere else in a 3D space, which is also a cognitive primitive, by the way, like the idea of a, of a three-dimensional space, it can be here and over here and be the same thing, right? And, and you can kind of see children mm -hmm. learning these, these primitives as, as their, their kids, right? And, and experimenting and, and learning about if you hide an object under something, it's contained. And if you remove the container, the object's still there again. I haven't lost my piece of candy. That's, yeah. that's what I think is meant by cognitive primitives. Cool. So we'll take another question. And by the way, it was myriology, not um, metonymy is that part whole relationship thing. Um, so uh, Philip says, do you think it's possible to understand complex neural networks? Is mechanistic interpretability feasible? Um, I think no. Having spoken with Neil the other day, uh, I, I don't mean to trivialize it. Neural networks are incredibly complicated. We're, we're dealing with these models and forms of computation that are beyond our cognitive horizon. We're kind of playing with these knobs and levers and we're tuning these optimization algorithms and we're producing these artifacts that we cannot understand. And all we can do is test them in a variety of different ways. And mechanistic interpretability is when you take a cross section and you try and understand something in isolation, but it's not really giving you a holistic understanding. So um, Jacob, what do you think? Yeah, well, I would say that um, if the addition example is anything to go by, I mean, you, you look at the addition and, and look what it produced, and then there are things that are just, you know, orders of magnitude more complicated than a simple addition operation. So I, I would hate to think what it looks like uh, when you map it all out symbolically to, to see, holy shit, look what this thing's actually doing, you know? So I would say that it kind of, it seems a little bit, dangerously on the intractable side to really um, truly understand what's happening in a in a large giant neural network you know so I don't know I think it's a bit of a lost cause myself and even if you can do it I don't think that it's particularly practical anyway so um, you might be able to fit like you know if you wanted to understand this one thing that happens in a neural network sure you might be able to spend a lot of time and resources and stuff figuring out what that one thing does but what if you want to know everything you know what I mean so um, the, the the complexity just kind of goes up from there so i don't think that it's probably a, a very um tractable way of going about the problem what other questions okay. have we got got some time anybody have anybody have uh some killer questions do we miss any 
Well, um, Howard said, I feel you guys should all read The Impossibility of Language Acquisition and How They Do It, which was a paper at the Annual Review of Linguistics. So thank you very much for that, Howard. We will definitely check that out. By the way, and, Tim linked, um, yeah. you, you know, if you guys don't know about the uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of, of Philosophy, <laughs> it's, it's the most dangerous rabbit hole for me, uh, you know, because I'm sort of an armchair yeah. philosopher. I'm not, I'm not trained as a, as a philosopher, but I go to this... Uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. I can disappear for hours, you know, reading reading articles there. It's it's a really fun website. That it's and an online amazing. etymology. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. And actually, when when we uh, spoke to Chomsky yesterday about um, uh, Wittgenstein, he said, "No, Wittgenstein is completely irrelevant. All you need to do is go to Plato, you know, the Stanford Encyclopedia, <laughs> and and look look at the Wittgenstein uh, entry and just look how little was written there, and that's all you need to know." That was his that was his answer. Mm. Um, and also on the on the Muriology thing, the only reason that's fresh in my mind is because I asked that to Carl Friston in respect of GLOM. You know, Hinton's GLOM is a cognitive architecture, uh, an inductive prior that looks at part whole relationships. I wanted to quickly touch on Salvador Dali, who said that have we spoken about full cognitive architectures like Jepper? Yes, we have. Watch the, um, I think it's about a 50 minute intro that we did on that on the beginning of the first Chomsky episode. So go and check that out. Um, sorry, Jacob, you, you were saying. Oh, no, that's all right. I wasn't actually saying anything, but um, there are lots of interesting cognitive architectures out there which are definitely, like, if you're interested at all in AGI, you really have to look into these architectures. Like, some of them, um, like, aren't what I'd say are quite there in terms of, you know, what's needed to get us to AGI and all that, but they're still instructive nonetheless. Um, obviously, there's SOAR, which is, like, that's one of the oldest ones from John Laird, and that's actually still being actively worked on, and his work is still good, like, even outside of that, because he goes into, he's written a lot of papers on just, cognitive architectures themselves like what they need to contain and what they need to be able to do and all that sort of thing and another like name drop i should probably be worth it's worth um listening is Kristen thorison he he does a lot of really good quality work on cognitive architectures yeah. and he has his own cognitive architecture called era which goes into a, like a lot of the stuff which i don't know we did, didn't quite have time to touch on today because we've only got an hour but you know he's it, it's all about autonomy like it's it's all about you know automatic goal generation, setting goals and, you know, which are a function of what the agent knows. So as the agent lear learns more about its environment and itself and everything else, it can set new goals, which in an ever expanding horizon. So it starts small and it just keeps on going and going and going and getting recursively self-improving. It can modify its own uh, instructions and its own architecture. It can introspect to itself and it, it, its code is all available to itself. So it's, it's, it's got like the instruction set of its of the code that it's written in is available as knowledge to it so it knows how its own machine works it knows how to manipulate those instructions so yeah it's really worth checking out honestly like and that, i think that's probably the main yeah. thing missing in today's ai is the fact that there's not enough emphasis on agency on um on cognitive architectures on automatic goal setting and just autonomy in general there needs to be a lot more of a focus on all of that also, and I can vouch for Kristen uh, Thorison. He's a professor at um, one of the universities in Iceland. When I was reading up about intelligence, he's written extensively about intelligence, and I got him to record a five-minute video, which we have inserted into our uh, upcoming documentary on intelligence, and we're going to interview him again soon. But anyway, um, th this draws uh, to a close, I I'm, I'm afraid. But if you folks like the live format, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit more impromptu and less formal than, than usual. Yep. If this is valuable to you, we do have some lives coming up. We've got two with Connor Leahy next week, one with Joshua Bark and one with Grady Booch, who gave the Turing lecture about 10 years ago. So, you know, two very, very big folks. And we're also going to do another one with Connor Leahy in person, but still alive, um, I think, the um, at the beginning of July with David Foster. So we've got a few things lined up. Anyway, thank you all very much for joining and we'll see you soon. Yeah, this was fun. Bye-bye.